Section 12 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Felder. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. Thomas Brackett Reed. Thomas Brackett Reed. In the preface to his edition of Shakespeare, which is as entertaining as it is neglected, Dr. Johnson says in his finest manner, The poet of whose work I have undertaken the revision may now begin to assume the dignity of an ancient and claim the privilege of established fame and prescriptive veneration. He has long outlived his century, the term commonly fixed as the test of literary merit. I have often thought that if the period of time fixed by Dr. Johnson as the test of literary merit were applied to certain other directions, it might be productive of good results. For instance, if the lapse of a century were made the condition precedent for the erection of statues and monuments, we should not only be spared some painful works of art, but we should not have so many bronze figures which in much less than a hundred years require an explanation of their existence. Local pride, personal affection, and the first outburst of grief are not always safe guides in determining either literary merit or the permanent position of any man in the history of his time. In the first few months or years after a man's death, it is difficult to get a true historical perspective, and the natural feelings of the moment are apt to distort our vision. These natural feelings, however, are not to be denied, and the temporarily distinguished will continue to receive their share of monuments, which in such cases ought certainly to be formed of material no more enduring than the fame of their subjects. Yet, after all, these lasting memorials of the ephemeral are only a part of those which either decorate or cumber the earth. Many, perhaps most, would be erected even if Dr. Johnson's test of literary merit were strictly enforced. The instinct of humanity for the really great, for the man who has made an ineffaceable mark on the history of his time, who has done some worthy deed or rendered some lasting service, is generally sound and true when death has once set all things even. This is conspicuously the case with the statue of Mr. Reed, which has recently been unveiled in Portland with appropriate ceremonies and with an excellent address by Mr. McCall of Massachusetts. Thomas Brackett Reed was not only a distinguished, but he was also a remarkable man, remarkable and unusual, both in intellect and character. He left a deep mark on the history of his time, and he rendered a very great public service in rescuing the House of Representatives from the condition of helpless insanity into which it had fallen, and by which the right of the majority to rule and the responsibility without which representative government must fail had both been well nigh destroyed. Rules devised originally to facilitate business and to give reasonable protection to the rights of the minority which under the old and less crowded conditions were both suitable and unabused, had gradually been perverted until public business was at a standstill, and the power to arrest all action had passed to an irresponsible minority, a contradiction of the first principles of free government. Neither the evil nor the cure was peculiar to the United States. The House of Commons passed through the same ordeal and was rescued in the same way, with one important difference— in England, the quorum of the commons consists of 40 members so small a number that it was useless as a weapon for obstruction. With us, a majority quorum is required by the Constitution, and refusing a quorum was the chief means of thwarting action. Mr. Reed met the difficulty by boldly counting those present to make a quorum whether they voted or not. It required nerve and courage to do it, and his action unchained a storm. He did not falter for a moment and carried his point, destroying the chief stronghold of obstruction at a blow. He was right in common sense as well as legally and constitutionally. The Supreme Court sustained him, and he had the satisfaction of seeing his political opponents adopt his rules. The fact was that the old parliamentary systems in both England and the United States, which were adapted to simpler conditions of business, society, and politics, were not only outworn, but had become a menace to free government. Mr. Reed destroyed the evil and established a new system. He had the loyal support of all his party associates, but it was he who did it, he alone, and I know of no other man then in public life who could have done it. His great ability was well known, but the patience, the calm, unflinching courage, the force of character which he displayed through all those trying weeks and months, and which were less generally understood, 
compelled the admiration even of his opponents. I followed and watched him through all that session of bitter conflict and stormy attack. Not only did he exhibit throughout the qualities I have mentioned, but, although he was capable of wrath and strongly combative, I never saw his good nature fail or his ready wit turn, as it might well have done, to anger and fierce denunciation. I remember that, one evening, when obstruction had been employed for hours to prevent a vote, and everybody was tired and in a bad temper, I went up to the speaker's desk and asked how long this business was to last. Mr. Reed, perfectly unruffled, turned around with a pleasant smile and said, We shall get a vote in about an hour. Springer has only two more pieces in his repertoire. My friend and colleague, the late Governor Greenhouse, in one of the many heated debates of that winter, quoted Tennyson's famous lines, and never were they more aptly applied than when he referred to Mr. Reed as one still strong man in a blatant land, whatever they call him, what care I, aristocrat, democrat, autocrat, one who can rule and dare not lie. One still strong man in a blatant land, whatever they call him, what care I, aristocrat, democrat, autocrat, one who can rule and dare not lie. Not only was he at that moment the still strong man, but he was then and always a man who dared not and could not lie either to himself or to others. No leader was ever more loyally followed by his party or more deeply respected by the house at large than was Mr. Reed. Yet he never stopped to curry favor with the house, nor did he hesitate to rebuke it. I remember well on one occasion when he thought that the house was acting, or was about to act, in a cowardly manner, how he told them in the phrase of the Weather Bureau that he had never regarded the house as a courage center, but that this special weakness went beyond all limits. The reform of the rules was a great achievement, preeminently the achievement of a statesman of high order who looked before and after. The word statesman, however, especially in connection with Mr. Reed himself, cannot be used without at once recalling his famous definition. I happened to sit next to him in the house, and he showed me the letter asking him to define a statesman, and his reply, a statesman is a successful politician who is dead. The epigram was published, flew over the country, and has become a familiar quotation. But the sequel is less well known. The correspondent who asked the question telegraphed as soon as he received the answer. Why don't you die and become a statesman? Mr. Reed handed me the telegram and said, Here is my answer. No. Fame is the last infirmity of noble mind. It was extremely unsafe to enter with Mr. Reed upon the exchange of sallies and retorts so beloved of Mrs. Wolfer's copper plate engravers. The first time I met him was in 1881 at Worcester. He had come to address our state convention, but the news of Garfield's death had just arrived, and it was felt that nothing should be done except the absolutely necessary business, and that, after adopting appropriate resolutions, the convention should at once adjourn. To Mr. Reed, who had come from Maine on our invitation to make a speech, the situation was a difficult one, but of course he assented to the wishes of the committee. I can see him now as he sat in the little anteroom, looking like a giant, and seeming to fill the room with his presence. His personality, both physical and mental, was so large and so powerful that when, in any connection or for any reason, I recall him or anything he said, I not only see him with the utmost vividness, but the whole scene rises in memory. Whether it was in the capital or in a house, on the street or in the country, in a crowd or in solitude, that the incident occurred. Memory is dominated by that commanding figure and by the sense of power and force which went with it. After that first meeting, I met Mr. Reed from time to time, and in 1884 I recall coming across him one day in State Street, just after the nomination of Mr. Blaine. The break in the Republican Party had begun, and I asked Mr. Reed what he thought of the outlook. Well, he said, it is a great comfort to think that the wicked politicians were not allowed to pick the candidate and that the nomination was made by the people. The politicians would have been guided only by a base desire to win. After this chance meeting, I saw Mr. Reed more and more frequently, until I went to Congress in 1887, and then I was in his company every day, and became not only intimate with him, but very fond of him, for he was capable of inspiring the warmest affection in the friends to whom he was attached. The general public, which fully recognized Mr. Reed's great intellectual force, which delighted to repeat his witticisms, and which rejoiced in his powers in debate and in seeing him overwhelm his antagonists, did not realize, I think, and perhaps it was impossible that they should realize, the warmth of his affection and the loyalty of his nature and the tenderness and sympathy shown not only to those for whom he cared, 
but for all who sorrowed or were heavy laden. I have no doubt that these qualities, which were so apparent to me, were hidden to the world by the reserve characteristic of the race from which Mr. Reed sprang, a race which shrinks from any easy or noisy display of emotion, but whose feelings are perhaps deeper and stronger because habitually repressed. For Mr. Reed was a typical New Englander, in the fullest sense of the word. He was typical in every way, in his intellect, in his character, in his reserve, in the depth of his feelings, and in his independence of thought and action. He came rightly by it, for he was of pure New England stock. He was a lineal descendant of George Cleve or Cleves, the first settler in the Portland region, and took a keen delight in that old Puritan's troubles with the constituted authorities. He was born, brought up, and educated in Maine, and was as representative of his state as he was of his race. I believe the house in which he was born still stands. At all events, it was in existence not long ago, and while he was speaker, someone sent him a photograph of it. His secretary and successor in Congress, Mr. Allen, brought it to him and said, That's a pretty good house to have been born in. Mr. Reed looked at it and said, Yes, Amos, but you see, I was not born in all that house pointing to an addition made since his time. Even then, said Mr. Allen, it is a pretty good house to have been born in. Yes, said Mr. Reed, but still I was not born in more than two or three rooms of it. There, in the city of his birth, he went to school, and thence to Bowdoin College, and then, after a year or two of teaching, he entered the Navy for service in the Civil War. When the war ended, he betook himself to California with a vague plan of settling in that new country. He used to tell with intense delight of his examination for admission to the bar of California. A young Southerner came before the judge for examination at the same time. The judge asked the Southerner if the legal tender acts were constitutional, and the young man answered without a moment's hesitation, no. Then the judge turned to Mr. Reed and asked him the same question. Mr. Reed, with equal promptness, answered, yes. Very well, said the judge, you are both admitted. Two men who can answer that question without hesitation ought to be admitted to any bar. Mr. Reed did not remain long in California. He returned to Maine, began the practice of law in Portland, rose rapidly to the front rank of his profession, became attorney general, and in 1876 was elected to Congress from the Portland District. He had been 10 years in Congress when I became a member and was the recognized leader of the Republican minority. On the first day after we had been sworn in, the usual drawing for seats took place. I was standing beside Mr. Reed behind the rail, and we waited patiently while all the names seemed to be called out except ours. It was painfully evident that we should be among the last and should draw very poor seats. I said to Mr. Reed that our luck seemed pretty bad. Yes, he said, the great trouble with this system is that it is so diabolically fair. Not long after, in the allotment of committee places, I found myself a member of the committee on elections. We began at once to report our findings, and one day when we had called up a case, Mr. Reed came into the house and happened to ask me what was going on. I said, an election case, and started to explain it. No explanation is necessary, said Mr. Reed. The house never divides on strictly partisan lines, except when it is acting judicially. For six years I served with Mr. Reed in the House, and during that time he was for four years the leader of the minority and for two years speaker. He was easily the greatest parliamentary leader I ever saw. I fully appreciate the truth of Emerson's doctrine of the force of understatement, but I cannot express my own belief in regard to Mr. Reed without also saying that in my opinion there never has been a greater or more perfectly equipped leader in any parliamentary body at any period. This conviction has only deepened with time, and it seems to me now, when the contests in which he engaged have long since passed into history, that Mr. Reed possessed, in the highest degree, all the qualities necessary for leadership in a great representative body controlled by the party system, which is common to this country and to Great Britain. In the first place, he was a master of parliamentary practice. He not only knew thoroughly the complicated rules of the House, but, what is even rarer, he was equally master of general parliamentary law and understood, as very few men do, the theory and philosophy of the system. His mind was at once acute and broad. Acuteness will make a man very effective on the countless points which arise from a complicated system of procedure, but mere acuteness is not enough to constitute a great parliamentarian. There must be, in addition, a knowledge of general parliamentary law and a full understanding of the fact that the system is not a haphazard collection of precedents, 
but that it rests upon broad principles and aims at well-defined objects. These conditions Mr. Reed fulfilled in the largest measure, and it was his complete mastery of the whole science, as well as his intimate knowledge of the rules, which enabled him to carry through his great reform. It was essential to his success that the House should have no doubt of the fact that no one on the floor was the equal of the chair in dealing with a question of parliamentary law. It was in the chair, therefore, that his powerful grasp of the subject and his immense knowledge came fully into play. For as leader of the minority, he had no taste for obstruction or for making petty points, which are such irresistible temptations to the sharp but small practitioner. Yet although he did not indulge in little points himself, he fought in the minority as he did in power against any abuse of the rules, and he resented strongly any effort to achieve a partisan advantage by an improper ruling. Such efforts roused his indignation not merely from party interest, but because he could not endure violations of the general principles upon which all parliamentary law rests. One day, in a parliamentary discussion, someone cited a ruling and attributed it to Mr. Carlyle, for whose eminent abilities both as a lawyer and as a parliamentarian, Mr. Reed, like all the rest of us, had the highest respect. Mr. Reed at once rose. That ruling, he said, was not made by the speaker. When the speaker permits such a ruling as that to be made, he yields the chair to the gentleman from Illinois. He has too much respect for the rules of this house and for parliamentary law to make such a ruling himself. But it was as a leader in debate that Mr. Reed was at his best. He was the finest, the most effective debater I have ever seen or heard. His readiness was very remarkable. I never saw him at a loss. He had a greater power of stating a case unanswerably in a few words than any man I have ever known. His presence of mind never failed, and I do not recall an occasion when he was obliged to explain or retreat from a position suddenly taken, a mishap which may happen to the best and most competent of leaders. With his exceptional capacity for terse, forcible, and lucid statement, was joined the unrivaled power of retort for which he was famous. His mind worked with astonishing rapidity, and his natural originality of thought enabled him always to take the unexpected in an unexpected way. When he stood up, waiting for an opponent to conclude, filling the narrow aisle with his hands resting upon a desk on each side, with every trace of expression banished from his face, and looking as if he had not an idea and hardly heard what was being said, then was he most dangerous. Then I knew that like Lord Thurlow, who was said when he rose from the wool sack to have looked like Jove when he grasped the thunder, Mr. Reed was ready to launch a bolt which would make its victim remember that day's battle with lasting regret. The House of Representatives, like the House of Commons, loves and follows the man who shows its sport, and that Mr. Reed never failed to do. Whether it was the condensed lucid statement to which it was an intellectual pleasure to listen, or fun in which he abounded, or ridicule of which he was past master, or wit and sarcasm which cut and scarred when it fell like the lash of a whip, the house was never disappointed and was well aware of the fact. One of his retorts, so well known that it is a household word, illustrates his quickness as well as any other. Mr. Springer of Illinois was declaring with large and loud solemnity that in the words of Henry Clay, he had rather be right than be president. The gentleman need not be disturbed, interjected Mr. Reed. He never will be either. Hardly a day passed that a repartee of this kind did not fall from his lips and they belong to that small class of witty retorts which cannot in the nature of things have been prepared, and which fly out on the spur of the moment like the sparks from an anvil. He was particularly strong in debate under the five-minute rule, which puts a debater's powers to the severest test. To make a point and an effective statement in five minutes demands much skill. Mr. Reed had himself a perfect conception both of the difficulties and opportunities of the five-minute debate. I remember his saying to my friend John Russell of my own state, a very clever and most delightful man, Russell, you do not understand the theory of five-minute debate. The object is to convey to the house in the space of five minutes either information or misinformation. You have consumed several periods of five minutes this afternoon without doing either. Mr. Reed, like most men of vigorous nature, was a strong partisan, and in the conflicts of party he was very formidable, for his attacks upon his political opponents were severe and always pushed home. But what stirred his wrath was anything which seemed to him mean or underhand. He was a good hater, and he detested shams, humbug, and pretense above everything else. If he saw these qualities in a man, he was unforgiving. 
There was a Democratic member conspicuous in my time who, in Mr. Reed's opinion, came within this class. He was a large, fine-looking, and distinctly able man. It was said that he was unscrupulous politically, and he was certainly a dangerous antagonist. He spoke with an affectation of great frankness and honesty, and he was very fond of the words candor and candid, which gave a special offense to Mr. Reed. They had many encounters, and able as our candid friend was, he was always worsted. I was standing by one day when he came over and expostulated with Mr. Reed on his severity, which led only to a frank expression of Mr. Reed's opinion of him and his methods. At last this member died, and in due time was eulogized in both houses. Just after the eulogies, some friends of mine came to Washington from Boston, and I invited Reed and McKinley and some others to meet them at dinner. The conversation turned on the subject of the recent eulogies. Mr. Reed gave his opinion and account of the deceased member in his usual incisive way, and then said, There are those who believe that the spirits of the departed are all about us. I trust the spirit of is here to-night, for I should like him to hear once more the opinion of him and his performances, which I have so often expounded to him in public and private during his life. The wit and humor were not carefully kept for public display or for the exigencies of debate. Mr. Reed did not lay his good things aside for use only in public. They came as readily and generously in private and in talk with a single friend. I remember one which illustrates the readiness that never failed, and which I will venture to repeat. It was after a dinner party. The conversation had turned on gambling and betting. Mr. X said, It is a curious thing, perhaps, but I never made a bet on a horse, a card, or anything else in my life. To this, a senator replied with great earnestness, I wish I could say that. Why can't you? asked Mr. Reed. X did. There was no one Mr. Reed respected more than Mr. X, but that could not stay the jest. Yet it would be a great misconception of Mr. Reed to suppose that the deep humor and the quick wit for which he was famous were his chief attributes, or that they were used merely to bring laughter or to furnish a telling retort in debate or conversation. They were only two of the weapons in his large intellectual armory and if the most frequently used, were by no means the most important. He could truly have said with Dr. Holmes, While my gay stanza pleased the banquet's lords, my soul within was tuned to deeper chords. In addition to the power of orderly, effective, unanswerable statement of a proposition, he could make a great argument on a great subject. He rose to the heights in the denunciation of wrong or wrongdoing, and in the advocacy of what he believed to be right. In his long speeches, of which he was very sparing, the humor, the sarcasm, and the wit were all present, flashing out and illuminating his subject, but they went deeper than laughter and carried profound reflection with them. In the course of his speech closing the debate on the Mills Bill, May 19, 1888, for the Republican side, he said, After all, this exaggerated idea of the profits of manufacturers is at the bottom of the chairman's feelings. Whenever I walk through the streets of that democratic importing city of New York and look at the brownstone fronts, my gorge always rises. I can never understand why the virtue which I know is on the sidewalk is not thus rewarded. I do not feel kindly to the people inside. But when I feel that way, I know what the feeling is. It is good, honest, high-minded envy. When some other gentlemen have the same feeling, they think it's political economy. Here is an apt illustration not only of his wit, but the more penetrating touch, which in a sentence uncovers a common foible of human nature. A little later in the same speech occurs another passage, which I will give in full, because it is such an excellent illustration of Mr. Reed's power of ridiculing with all the resources of rhetoric, a sham which he hated and which his illustrations and similes exposed by the law of contrasts. Monopoly, said Horace Greeley, a doctor of laws and once a candidate of the Democratic Party for the presidency. Monopoly is perhaps the most perverted and misapplied word in our much abused mother tongue. How very tame this language is. I suppose that during the ten years last past, I have listened in this hall to more idiotic raving, more pestiferous rant on that subject than on all the others put together. And yet I do not regret it. What a beautiful sight it is to see the revenue reform orator go into action against monopoly. Nelson, as he stood blazing with decorations on the decks of the victory, on the fatal day of Trafalgar, Napoleon at Friedland, as the guard went cheering and charging by, Thomas Sayers, as he stripped for the championship of England when Heenan had crossed the lifting waters, 
the eagle soaring to his eyrie, the royal man-eating Bengal tiger in his native jungle, nay, the very bull himself, the strong bull of Bishan, as he uplifts his bellow over the rocky deserts of Palestine, are all but pale reminders of one of these majestic creatures, and yet, outside the patent office, there are no monopolies in this country, and there never can be. Ah, but what is that I see on the far horizon's edge, with tongue of lambent flame and eye of forked fire, serpent-headed and griffin-clawed? Surely it must be a great new chimera. Trust. Quick, cries every masked member of the Ways and Means. Quick, let us lower the tariff. Let us call in the British. Let them save our devastated homes. Courage, dear brethren, be not too much disturbed. The Lord will reign even if the board of mayor and aldermen should adjourn. One other instance of the deeper note which his wit and humor so often struck will suffice. In an article about the tariff, he spoke of the attraction which free trade offers because it presents a number of convenient aphorisms, and people like to feel that they have truth in a nutshell and can take it out and look at it and think that truth is simple. The fact is, he continued, that half-truths are simple, but the whole truth is the most complicated thing on earth. There the epigram strikes at the root of things and conveys a real philosophy. One other instance occurs to me which shows his power of illustration as well as the capacity for epigram. He had been hearing a great deal from the free trade side of the survival of the fittest and the folly of attempting to set aside the great natural law by statute. Mr. Reed referred to this in his reply and said, I quote from memory, Gentlemen are fond of talking about the survival of the fittest, but they never complete the sentence. It is not the abstractly fittest who survive. The sentence really is the survival of the fittest to survive. That is, the fittest for a given environment. If you cast a minnow and the magnificent bowl of Bashan into the Atlantic Ocean, there is no question which is the nobler organism, the abstractly fittest. But the great bowl of Bashan will perish and the minnow will survive in that environment. The fact was that Mr. Reed had a mind of remarkable originality. He not only was an eminently independent thinker and a very strong and sound one, but he thought in his own way and framed his conclusions in a manner peculiar to himself. Every fact, every occurrence, important or unimportant, common or uncommon, was returned or reflected from his mind at an angle quite different from that of other people. A very trifling incident will illustrate my meaning. He came one day to lunch with me in the Senate restaurant. We sat down in a cramped space at a very small table. In compressing himself into the corner, he overturned a glass and the ice which it contained fell out on the floor. He picked up the glass, and looking at me with his quizzical expression said, I don't care. It isn't my ice. There was nothing of consequence in either incident or remark, but the mental process and the angle of reflection were entirely different from those of other people. Another little story that comes to my mind illustrates these same qualities. A member of the house, who was also a warm friend of Mr. Reed, was sitting one day at his desk with his legs and feet extended into the aisle. The speaker came up the narrow path, and my friend said, moving as he spoke, Let me get down out of your way, Mr. Speaker. Reed looked down and said, One will do, and passed on. I should like to say much of Mr. Reed as a great political leader and a constructive statesman outside of Congress, as well as in the House. I should like especially to say something of him when he was a candidate for the presidency. I supported him as strongly as I could and had the honor of presenting his name to the convention at St. Louis. I was familiar with all the incidents of his candidacy, and I know how he declined to promise offices from the cabinet down or to spend money to secure Southern delegates. He lost the nomination, but he kept his honor pure and his high conception of public duty unstained and unimpaired. Unfortunately, the limits of space compel me to confine myself to this inadequate attempt to give an impression of him simply as the parliamentary chief, the leader and speaker of the house where his greatest fame was won. Yet I cannot close without a word about him as a man. He was many-sided, a great reader, deeply versed in English literature, and also in the literature of France, especially old France, upon which he used to work at night with a teacher in the busiest times of an exciting session. He was a lover of art and natural scenery and knew much of both. He liked to travel both at home and abroad, wandering about in cities and watching the people, for he was a close observer and always learning. No more agreeable companion ever lived. Like Dr. Johnson, he loved to sit and have his talk out, and no one was ever better to listen to or a better listener, for his sympathies were wide, his interests unlimited, and nothing human was alien to him. 
With the friends he cared for, and he was himself the most loyal of friends, he would sit or walk by the hour, talking of everything, and the talk was always fresh, keen, and suggestive, and the great, hearty, contagious laugh would come at intervals and carry everyone with it. To those who knew him best and loved him most, it is sad to speak of him as a figure in history, sadder still to think that the great nature, the wit, the humor, the sympathy, the deep laughter, the honest indignation are now only memories. End of section 12, Thomas Brackett Reed. Section 13 of The Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge An American Myth Everyone who has studied history is familiar with the myths which crowd its pages. I do not mean by this the frankly mythical tales which tell of gods and goddesses, of the divine founders of nations, tribes, and families, or those in which the Middle Ages delighted and which were replete with angels and devils, with witches and sorcerers, with magic and miracles. The myths to which I refer are those which masquerade as history, which are modern as well as ancient, which make no pretense to the supernatural, but which, being either pure invention or a huge growth from some little seed of fact, possess all the characteristics of their great namesakes, which have rejoiced the world for centuries awakened almost every emotion of which the human heart is capable and from which the historian and the man of science have been able to learn innumerable lessons as to the thoughts and beliefs the hopes and fears of primitive man these historical myths grow up silently some of them reign unquestioned for centuries modern research has exposed many of ancient lineage and long acceptance and has torn away the mask and revealed them in their true character. Yet the historical myth rarely dies. No exposure seems able to kill it. Expelled from every book of authority, from every dictionary and encyclopedia, it will still live on among the great mass of humanity. The reason for this tenacity of life is not far to seek. The myth, or the tradition, as it is sometimes called, has necessarily a touch of imagination and imagination is almost always more fascinating than truth the historical myth indeed would not exist at all if it did not profess to tell something which people for one reason or another like to believe and which appeals strongly to some emotion or passion and so to human nature itself thus the historical myth not only defies its enemies who are interested in the truth about the past but it springs up and comes to maturity in these present days even under the full and relentless glare of the searchlight of science or beneath the microscope of the antiquary it is so hardy that it withstands the examination of the scientific historian and of the student and writer of history sometimes the historical myth is mischievous perverting or inventing important facts on which history turns and by which judgments are made up and conclusions drawn in such cases too much pains cannot be expended in its destruction but in most cases the historical myth is harmless except upon the general consideration that all historical falsehoods are bad both great and small and that truth ought to prevail for mighty as truth is the assertion of the motto that it will prevail however agreeable in theory is open to some doubt in practice to illustrate the ordinary variety of historical myths we need not go further than the life of washington the youthful conversations of our first president with his father the undiluted invention of the voracious weems have been shattered again and again but they live on in the popular mind, and nothing can extirpate them. The masterly statesmanship, which by the Jay Treaty sacrificed the French alliance 
in order that the british posts which arrested our advance and threatened our independence might be removed is little known and less appreciated but every child has heard of the flat and fatuous moralities which means stole from beatty and with his own improvements foisted upon the great leader of the revolution washington was never a marshal of france and there is no evidence that he was ever given a sword by frederick the great yet both stories have been widely believed both crop up from time to time are roundly defended and then sink down only to rise again as smiling and as false as they were in the beginning the little myth with which i propose to deal here is even more unimportant than those i have just cited as examples of the tribe but the process of its growth can be traced with singular exactness which is seldom the case and the processes of development are just as characteristic in a small myth as in a large and important one and therefore equally instructive and equally serviceable in teaching us how to recognize the falsehood in history how to weigh historical evidence and how to reach the truth as nearly at least as is possible to mere finite understandings the historical myth whose growth and fortunes i am about to trace has one distinct advantage it is not only connected with a great man and his notorious opponent but it is also involved with an unsolved murder case and as marjorie fleming wisely said quote, the history of all the criminals as ever was hanged is amusing End quote. the case also gives some glimpses of society a hundred years ago which afford queer contrasts with the manners and habits of the present time moreover i have a personal interest in the tale for confession being good for the soul i must admit that i am in this case one of that numerous class who accept a myth without sufficient investigation add to it the weight of their acceptance be it much or little and then pass it on as i did in this instance on december twenty second seventeen ninety nine a young woman named julielna elmore sands familiarly known as elma sands left her home in greenwich street near franklin street in the city of new york and did not return two days later on the twenty fourth of december footnote see testimony of andrew blanc in coleman's report page fifty three also page twenty nine in footnote a muff which she carried was found by a boy in or near the manhattan well which was situated in lispinard's meadow at a point now reached by an alley running from green street and not far from spring street curiously enough this clue was not followed with any energy until a week later when the body was recovered on january second eighteen hundred there were marks indicating that the unfortunate girl might have received rough treatment but the tears in the dress and the bruises and abrasions were not of a conclusive character the body was taken from the well to the house of mr and mrs ring distant relatives with whom elma sands had lived and was there laid out for some three days and on one day was exposed to public view in the street when crowds came for the purpose of looking at it to exhibit the body of a murdered person in the street seems strange to us especially as there was no question of identification and is an instance of the contrast between the manners of a century ago and the present day whether this was a common occurrence it is not possible to say with complete assurance but it is certain that neither the witnesses nor anybody else spoke of it as strange or shocking dr hosack a leading physician of new york seems to have gone to look at the body out of mere curiosity quite as a matter of course footnote see testimony of dr hosack and also that of joseph watkins page seventy four coleman's report End footnote. such an exposure now in a public street is unimaginable in this particular case the custom may have been seized upon with especial avidity for the disappearance of the girl had produced a great deal of excitement which rose to fever heat after the finding of the body here again we come upon some odd differences between that time and this 
the newspapers granted little space and no headlines to the crime an ample proof of their utter inferiority to those with which we are blessed to-day which give columns and pictures and staring capitals even to the vulgarest and most uninteresting of criminals and crimes in another way the conduct of the newspapers in new york in the year eighteen hundred was even more pitiful not only did they refrain from efforts to influence and mislead the people but they actually deprecated attempts to prejudice the case and intimated in a poor-spirited way that an accused man of good character was entitled to a fair trial for by this time there was an accused on january sixth the grand jury brought in a verdict of quote, murder by a person or persons unknown end quote, and four days later indicted levi weeks a young builder and carpenter of excellent character and standing as the murderer weeks was the popular selection and suspicion had turned toward him with some reason he had been the girl's lover very intimate with her as appeared by the testimony where it was also in evidence that he was not the only fortunate person in this respect the public promptly determined that he was guilty although the newspapers with singular indifference to their duty did nothing in this direction and therefore other means were employed to influence public feeling against the prisoner handbills were circulated attacking the accused and casting suspicion upon him and what was still more singular these handbills told of the appearance of ghosts and goblins and dancing devils at the well and in the prison this appeal to the supernatural is another glimpse of the queer differences between that time and this one of those sharp contrasts in feelings and beliefs among the people which history rarely records and which are revealed only by a study of some contemporary document full of petty details like this once notorious but now forgotten trial for murder footnote for handbills see testimony in the case the best account of them is in the introduction to hardy's report of the trial page five End footnote. yet however strange goblins and ghosts may appear to us as a means of directing popular anger against a man accused of murder they had so far as we can judge an immense effect in the city of new york in the year eighteen hundred so far as the people were concerned levi weeks was tried and found guilty fortunately for him there was no referendum for a case like this although that improvement in the criminal law may yet be bestowed upon us if there had been his shrift would have been short because in that simpler time there was no opposition to capital punishment and no sentimentality about criminals indeed with an odd perversity which may well seem remarkable to us popular sympathy then went out to the murdered and not to the murderers thus it came about despite the public clamor and excitement that levi weeks in due course was brought to trial on march thirty first eighteen hundred the court which sat in the building at the corner of wall and nassau streets where the sub-treasury now stands was composed of chief justice lansing richard verrick the mayor and richard harrison the recorder the prosecuting officer was cadwallader golden assistant attorney general the counsel for the defense and their names explain the appearance of this trial in history were alexander hamilton brockholst livingston and aaron burr they were all leading lawyers at the bar one of them had been secretary of the treasury was a general in the army and the leader of the federalist party another was a leader of the democratic or as it was then called republican party and was on the eve of becoming vice president of the united states it would be interesting to follow the trial in detail for the crime was a striking one and the examination of the witnesses as always presents many pictures of life and is full of the attraction which abides in the revelations of the motives passions and weaknesses incident to human nature but an analysis of the trial 
is not my purpose, and space forbids that I should do more than sum up the result. The trial lasted two days and practically two nights. The newspapers comment on its length, and Hardy, in his preface, speaks of it as the most lengthy trial ever known. When one thinks of the interminable criminal trials which now disgrace our courts, with their vast expenditure of money and frequently with a defeat of the ends of justice, one cannot but feel that we have, in one respect at least, sadly degenerated from the standards of our ancestors one hundred years ago. At the close of this most lengthy trial, Levi Weeks was acquitted, the Chief Justice charging in his favor, and the jury remaining out only four minutes. To anyone who reads the report, it is obvious that no other verdict was possible. The prosecution failed to show that Weeks had gone out with Elma Sands on the 22nd of December, and the defense proved an alibi for Weeks on that evening so complete as to put any participation in the murder on his part practically beyond the bounds of possibility this brings us to the story connected with the trial which has carried it into history and which has assumed the dimensions of a well-established myth in eighteen fifty eight mr james parton published his life of aaron burr and on page one forty eight he gave the following account of an incident which occurred as he states in the course of the week's trial he colonel burr used to say that he had once saved a man from being hanged by a certain arrangement of the candles in a courtroom he referred to a trial for murder in which both hamilton and himself defended the prisoner and which excited intense interest at the time at first the evidence against the prisoner seemed conclusive and i think burr himself thought him guilty but as the trial proceeded suspicions arose against the principal witness colonel burr subjected him to a relentless cross-examination and he became convinced that the guilt lay between the witness and the prisoner with the balance of probability against the witness the man's appearance and bearing were most unprepossessing besides being remarkably ugly he had the mean down look which is associated with the timidity of guilt hamilton had addressed the jury with his usual fluent eloquence confining his remarks to the vindication of the prisoner without alluding to the probable guilt of the witness the prosecuting attorney replied and it was now burr's province to say the last word for the prisoner but the day had worn away the court took a recess till candlelight this was extremely annoying to colonel burr as he meditated enacting a little scene to the success of which a strong light was indispensable he was not to be balked however through one of his satellites of whom he always had several revolving around him he caused an extra number of candles to be brought into the courtroom and to be so arranged as to throw a strong light upon a certain pillar in full view of the jury against which the suspected witness had leaned throughout the trial the court assembled the man resumed his accustomed place and colonel burr rose with the clear conciseness of which he was master he set forth the facts which bore against the man and then seizing two candelabra from the table he held them up toward him throwing a glare of light upon his face and exclaimed behold the murderer gentlemen every eye was turned on the wretch's ghastly countenance which to the excited multitude seemed to wear the very expression of a convicted murderer the man reeled as though he had been struck then shrunk away behind the crowd and rushed from the room the effect of this incident was decisive colonel burr concluded his speech the judge charged the jury gave a verdict of acquittal and the prisoner was free it will be observed that mr parton gives no authority whatever for any of the statements in the passage just quoted when i wrote my biography of hamilton more than twenty-five years ago 
i rejected the parton account of the supposed incident because on the very face of his statement the whole tale appeared so utterly improbable for example he says that he arranged the candle so as to throw a strong light upon a certain pillar where the witness was standing the witness croucher being no longer on the stand had nothing to do but to step to one side and get out of the light again burr was a good lawyer and he never would have made such a speech as parton described and would have been stopped by the court if he had tried to do so these are but two of the points which a casual reading discloses but when we put mr parton's account beside the shorthand report of the trial the result is really startling he says that croucher was the principal witness he was not mrs ring was the principal witness and there were others much more important than croucher he says that colonel burr subjected croucher to a relentless cross-examination the cross-examination of croucher as reported in shorthand was neither long nor very serious and there is no evidence that burr conducted it he says quote, hamilton had addressed the jury with his usual fluent eloquence End quote. hamilton never addressed the jury at all he says quote, it is now burr's province to say the last word for the prisoner End quote. this statement that burr spoke in closing after the prosecuting officer was one of the assertions that made mr parton's account unbelievable even without examination but as a matter of fact there were no closing speeches burr as the junior counsel opened the case for the defense it was a very good speech in which he made some legal points and insinuated in a very guarded manner that the real culprit must be found among the witnesses but there is not a word in that speech in the least resembling those which pardon attributes to burr after the evidence was all in burr read to the jury an extract from hale's pleas of the crown and that was all he did the fact is that pardon's account was pure invention and there is no indication that he ever read a report of the trial for if he had then what he said would have been of course a simple falsification of the record three years later in eighteen sixty one mr john c hamilton published his life of his father which he called a history of the republic of the united states on pages seven forty five to seven forty seven in volume seven he gave his account of the alleged incident in the week's trial it is as follows an occurrence had taken place which greatly excited the sympathies of the inhabitants of the city of new york the body of a female was found in a public well and a young mechanic of reputable character who had been her suitor was suspected of and indicted for the murder hamilton was engaged to defend him a careful investigation left no doubt in his mind of the innocence of the accused and his suspicions fell upon a principal witness for the prosecution but the public feeling had been artfully directed against his client and to overcome its passionate prejudices was a herculean task the office of defending him was rendered invidious and fearing that his talents would rescue the destined victim from their grasp hamilton when he appeared in the court of justice was regarded by the multitude in this the only time of his life with a dark and sullen animosity he resolved not merely to secure the acquittal of his client but to place his character beyond all just suspicion it would in this view be a great victory so to operate on the jury in the progress of the evidence as to supersede the necessity of summing up the case to this object he bent all his efforts the evidence was circumstantial with the exception of that of the witness who hamilton felt convinced was a criminal after an exertion of all his logical powers and disentangling the web which had been wound around the accused and in showing that the crime must have been perpetrated by another hand the suspected witness was called to the stand on his evidence the verdict would turn the prolonged trial had extended far into the night and when croucher was sworn hamilton advanced placed a candle on each side of his face and fixed him with a piercing eye this was objected to but the court declared the extraordinary case warranted this procedure hamilton then remarked with the deepest tones of his voice quote, i have special reasons deep reasons reasons that i dare not express 
reasons that when the real culprit is detected and placed before the court will then be understood End quote. the audience bent forward in a breathless anxiety every eye turning from the prisoner to the witness when hamilton exclaimed quote, the jury will mark every muscle on his face every motion of his eye i conjure you to look through that man's countenance to his conscience End quote. having thus fixed the impression he pressed in a close examination the conscience-stricken culprit who plunged on from one admission to another from contradiction to contradiction the evidence closed as croucher withdrew from the stand the spectators turned away from him with horror and the jury acquitted the young mechanic without rising from their seats doubt still hung over the accused but the subsequent conviction of this witness of an execrable crime left little question of the justice of hamilton's suspicions i accepted the hamilton story in my biography as did mr john t morse in his life of hamilton published some years before mine the hamilton version on its face unlike the parton version had nothing obviously absurd or contradictory hamilton is there represented as placing the candles on each side of the witness while he was on the stand and could not move and the absurdity of winding up the case with a government witness on the stand could be set down to the fervor of the narration and to the writer's habitual inaccuracy but when we put the hamilton account beside the shorthand report it does not fare very much better than the inventions of mr parton in the first place mr john c hamilton omits entirely to say that hamilton had with him as associate counsel livingston and burr in the second place there is no evidence that hamilton conducted the cross-examination of croucher one of the three counsel for the prisoner cross-examined him but the report of the trial does not tell us which one it was as i have already said the cross-examination as reported was sufficient but not serious and there is not a trace of anybody's putting candles near him at that time nor is there a word resembling those which mr john c hamilton attributes to his father as the shorthand report carefully mentions the occasion when the candles were used it is fair to suppose that no such incident as that described by john c hamilton occurred when croucher was cross-examined the account of the cross-examination is imaginary and so of course is the part about croucher withdrawing from the stand and the spectators turning away from him with horror in eighteen seventy two mr william stone in his history of new york city adopted the parton story with certain modifications to make it less impossible of belief but gave no authorities for his version of the incident in the same year mr edward s gould published an article in the may number of harper's magazine entitled the manhattan well murdered the article was devoted to the murder and to the trial which mr gould considered a miscarriage of justice and he refers only in passing to the incident of the candles mr gould says that he had before him a manuscript report of the trial in hamilton's handwriting and on this he based his own account that hamilton should have made a shorthand report of the trial covering fifty-four pages seems on the face of it improbable the extract which mr gould gave in facsimile is obviously not in hamilton's handwriting as a most superficial comparison shows moreover the extract in the facsimile is a verbatim reproduction of coleman's shorthand report all mr gould's other extracts are either condensed versions or exact reproductions of the coleman report what he had in his possession was undoubtedly a draft of the coleman report taken from the original shorthand reports but although it was not by hamilton mr gould's material was authentic and accurate the same may be said of the account in dr hamilton's report about his grandfather published in nineteen ten he had before him the coleman report and therefore knew what really happened there were three reports of the week's trial one was a longhand report prepared by a man named longworth and put out the very day after the verdict to meet the popular demand and snatch the benefit of the first excitement 
Pullman speaks of it as an entirely worthless report, which is probably true, although I have not been able to find a copy of it. The second report was by James Hardy. This was also a longhand report and seems to have been carefully prepared and to be as accurate as such a report could be. The third was the shorthand report by William Coleman, which is both full and accurate. On page 82, there is given the evidence of William Dustin, which is as follows. Last Friday morning, a man, I don't know his name, came into my store. Here, one of the prisoners' counsel held a candle close to Croucher's face, who stood among the crowd, and asked the witness if it was he, and he said it was. He said, Good morning, gentlemen. Levi Weeks is taken up by the high sheriff, and there is fresh evidence against him from Hackensack. He then went away, and as he went out, he said, My name is Croucher, and this was all the business he had with me. There we have the entire foundation of the dramatic scene conjured up by Parton and John C. Hamilton. The report does not show which of the prisoners' counsel held a candle to Croucher's face, but Mrs. Hamilton, according to Mr. Gould, always said that it was her husband who did it, and in the absence of any other evidence, this may be accepted as the truth. It was a very natural thing to do. There was nothing remarkable about it. It might well have occurred to anybody in that ill-lighted courtroom when a question of identification was raised. A little later in the trial, a witness named Matthew Musty was on the stand, and he was asked by counsel for the prisoner, Do you know Levi Weeks? Should you know the person you speak of if you saw him? A. I do not know as I should. Q by the assistant attorney general take the candle and look round and see if you can pick him out he went nearer the prisoner and pointing to him said that was he footnote coleman's report page ninety End footnote that is the whole story of what actually happened it was a perfectly commonplace incident and it is interesting to see how it has been developed by two biographers relying on hearsay and wandering traditions into a picturesque and dramatic scene it is a quite perfect example of historical myth-making, one little natural incident developing into two full-grown myths. But it is to be feared that the stories of Parton and John C. Hamilton will continue to be repeated, for the unvarnished facts make no appeal to the imagination. The trial itself was dramatic enough and full of human interest, but that will all be passed over and forgotten in favor of a wholly unsupported legend which it is pleasant to have attached to the memory of an eminent man. End of section 13. Recording by Bill Mosley, Lano County, Texas, USA. Section 14 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. As two anthologies. As two anthologies. Footnote number one. This essay was written as an introduction to the best of the world's classics. Ten volumes of prose selections published by Funk and Wagnalls. Ever since civilized man has had a literature, he has apparently sought to make selections from it, and thus put his favorite passages together, under one roof, and in a compact and convenient form. Certain it is, at least, that to the Greeks, masters of all great arts, we owe this habit. They made such collections, and named them, after their pleasant imaginative fashion, a gathering of flowers or what we, borrowing their word, call an anthology. So to those austere souls who regard anthologies as a labor-saving contrivance for the benefit of persons who, like a smattering of knowledge, and are never really learned, we can at least plead in mitigation that we have high and ancient authority for the practice. In any event, no amount of scholarly deprecation has been able to turn mankind, or that portion of mankind which reads books, from the agreeable habit of making volumes of selections, and finding in them much pleasure, as well as improvement in taste and knowledge. 
with the spread of education and with the enormous increase of that literature among all civilized nations more especially since the invention of printing and its vast multiplication of books the making of volumes of selections comprising what is best in one's own or in many literatures is no longer a mere matter of taste or convenience as with the greeks but has become something a little short of necessity in this world of many workers comparatively few scholars and still fewer intelligent men of leisure anthologies have been multiplied like all other books and in the main they have done much good and little harm the man who thinks he is a scholar or highly educated because he is familiar with what is collected in a well-chosen anthology of course errs grievously such familiarity no more makes one a master of literature than a perusal of a dictionary makes the reader master of style but as the latter pursuit can hardly fail to enlarge a man's vocabulary so the former adds to his knowledge increases his stock of ideas liberalizes his mind and opens him to new sources of enjoyment the habit of the greeks was to bring together selections of verse passages of especial merit epigrams and short poems in the main their example has been followed from their days down to the elegant extracts in verse of our grandmothers and grandfathers and thence on to our own time with its admirable golden treasury and oxford handbook of verse there has been no end to the making of poetical anthologies and apparently no diminution in their public appetite for them poetry indeed lends itself to selection much of the best poetry of the world is contained in short poems complete in themselves and capable of transference bodily to a volume of selections there are very few poets of whose quality and genius a fair idea cannot be given by a few judicious selections a large body of noble and beautiful poetry a verse which is a joy for ever can also be given in a very small compass and the mechanical attribute of size it must be remembered is very important in making successful anthology for an essential quality of a volume of selections is that it should be easily portable that it should be a book which can be slipped into the pocket and readily carried about in any wanderings whether near or remote an anthology which is stored in one or more huge and heavy volumes is practically valueless except to those who have neither books nor access to a public library or who think that a stately tome printed on calendared paper and profusely illustrated is an ornament to a centre table in a parlour rarely used except on funereal or other official occasions i have mentioned these advantages of verse for the purpose of an anthology in order to show the difficulties which must be encountered in making a prose selection very little prose is to be found in small parcels which can be transferred entire and therefore with the very important attribute of completeness to a volume of selections from most of the great prose writers it is necessary to take extracts and the chosen passage is broken off from what comes before and after the fame of a prose writer as a rule rests on a book and really to know him the book must be read and not merely selected passages extracts give no very satisfactory idea of paradise lost or divine comedy and the same is true of extracts from a history or a novel it is possible by spreading prose selections through a series of small volumes to conquer the mechanical difficulty and thus make the selections in form what they ought above all things to be companions and not books of reference or table decorations but the spiritual or literary problem is not so easily overcome what prose to take and where to take it are by no means easy questions to solve they are well worth solving so far as patient effort can do it for in this period of easy printing it is desirable to put in convenient form before those who read examples of the masters which will draw us back from the perishing chatter of the moment to the literature which is the highest work of civilization and which is at once noble and lasting upon that theory this collection has been formed it is an attempt to give examples from all periods and languages of western civilization of what is best and most memorable in their prose literature 
that the result is not complete exhibition of the time and the literatures covered by the selections no one is better aware than the editors inexorable conditions of space make a certain degree of incompleteness inevitable when he who is gathering flowers traverses so vast a garden and is obliged to store the results of his labors within such narrow bounds the editors are also fully conscious that like all other similar collections this one too will give rise to the familiar criticism and questionings as to why such a passage was omitted and another inserted why this writer was chosen and that other passed by in literature we all have our favorites and even the most catholic of us has his dislikes if not his pet aversions i will frankly confess that there are authors represented in these volumes whose writings i should avoid just as there are certain towns and cities of the world which having once visited them i should never willingly return for the simple reason that i would not voluntarily subject myself to seeing or reading what i dislike or which is worse what bores and fatigues me no editor of an anthology must seek to impose upon others his own tastes and opinions he must at the outset remember and never afterward forget that so far as possible his work must be free from the personal equation he must recognize that some authors who may be mute or dull to him have a place in literature past or present sufficiently assured to entitle them to a place among selections which are attended above all things else to be representative to those who wonder why some favorite of their own was omitted while something else for which they do not care at all has found a place i can only say that the editors having suppressed their own personal preferences have proceeded on certain general principles which seem to be essential in making any selection either of verse or prose which shall possess broader and more enduring qualities than that of being a mere exhibition of the editor's personal taste to illustrate my meaning emerson's parnassus is extremely interesting as an exposition of the tastes and preferences of a remarkable man of great original genius as an anthology it is a failure for it is of awkward size is ill arranged and contains selections made without system and which in many cases baffle all attempts to explain their appearance on the other hand mr palgrave neither a very remarkable man nor a very great and original genius gave us in the first golden treasury a collection which has no interest whatsoever as reflecting the tastes of the editor but which is quite perfect in its kind bearing the disproportionate amount of wordsworth which includes some of his worst things and which be it said in passing was due to mr palgrave's giving way to that point to his personal enthusiasm the golden treasury in form in scope and in arrangement as well as in most unerring taste is the best model of what an anthology should be and which is found in any language returning now to our questioner who misses some favorites and finds something else which he dislikes the only answer as i have just said is that the collection is formed on certain general principles as any similar collection of the sort must be this series is called the best of the world's classics and classics is not used in the narrow and technical sense but rather in that of thoreau who defined classics as the noblest recorded thoughts of mankind therefore the first principle of guidance and selection is to take examples of the great writings which have moved and influenced the thought of the world and which have preeminently the quality of high seriousness as required by aristotle this test alone however would limit the selections too closely therefore the second principle of choice is to make selections from writers historically important either personally or by their writings the third rule is to endeavor to give selections which shall be representative of the various literatures and the various periods through which the collection ranges 
lastly and this applies of course only to passages taken from the writers of england and the united states the effort has been given specimens of the masters of english prose of that prose in its development and at its best and to show so far as may be what can be accomplished with that great instrument and what a fine style really is as exhibited in the best models everything contained in these volumes is there in obedience to at least one of these principles many in obedience to more than one some in conformity to all four no one will become a scholar or master of any of the great literatures here represented by reading this collection literature and scholarship are not to be had so cheaply as that yet is there much profit to be had from these little volumes they contain many passages which merit dr johnson's fine saying about books that they help us to enjoy life or teach us to endure it to the man of letters to the man of wide reading they will at least serve to recall when far from libraries and books those authors who have been the delight and the instructors of a lifetime they will surely bring with them the pleasures of memory and that keener delight which arises when we meet a poem or passage of prose which we know as an old and well-loved friend remote from home upon some alien page to that larger public whose lives are not spent among books and libraries and for whose delectation such a collection as this is primarily intended these volumes rightly read at odd times in idle moments in out-of-the-way places on the ship or the train offer much they will bring the reader in contact with many of the greatest intellects of all time they contain some of the noblest thoughts that have passed through the minds of our weak and erring race there is no man who will not be the better for the moment at least by reading what cicero says about old age seneca about death and socrates about love to go no further for examples than to the glory that was greece and the grandeur that was rome moreover the bowing acquaintance which can be formed here may easily offer attractions which will lead to a close and intimate friendship with all that the word implies in the case of a great author or a great book it seems to me for example that if no one who reads here the brief extracts from erasmus or from cervantes to take at random two writers widely separated in thought could fail to pursue the acquaintance thus begun so potent are the sympathetic charm the wit the wisdom and the humor of both of these great men there is at least variety in these little volumes and while many things in them may not appeal to us they may to our neighbor that which is dumb to us may speak to him again let it be noticed that there is much more than high seriousness which is the test of the greatest prose as of the finest poetry humor and pathos tragedy and comedy all find their place and glimpses of the pageant of human history flit through the pages it would seem as if it were impossible to read extracts from thucydides and tacitus and gibbon and not long to go to their histories and read all that could be said by such men about the life of man upon earth about athens and rome and the rise and fall of empires selections are unsatisfying and the better they are the more unsatisfying they become but this is in reality their true merit they have much beauty in themselves they awaken pleasant memories they revive old delights but above all if rightly read they open the gates to the illimitable gardens whence all the flowers which have here been gathered may be found blooming in radiance unplucked and unbroken and rooted in their native soil the most important part of the collection is that which gives selections from those writers whose native tongue is english no translation even of prose can ever quite reproduce its original and as a rule cannot hope to equal it there are many translations notably the elizabethan which are extremely fine in themselves and memorable examples of english prose still they are not the original writings something escapes in the translation into another tongue an impalpable something which cannot be held or transmitted the bible stands alone a great literary monument of the noblest and most beautiful english which has formed english speech and become a part of the language as it is the thought and emotion of the people who read the king james version in all parts of the globe 
yet we know that this version which the people so fortunate in its possession wisely and absolutely declined to give up in exchange for any revision is neither an accurate nor faithful reproduction of its original therefore putting aside the english bible as wholly by itself it may be safely said that the soul of a language and the beauties of style which is capable of exhibiting can only be found and studied in the productions of writers who not only think in the language in which they write but to whom the speech is native the inalienable birthright and heritage of their race or country in such writers we get not only the thought the humor or pathos and all that can be transferred in a translation but also the pleasure to the ear akin to music the sense of form the artistic gratification which form brings all those attributes which are possible in the highest degree to those only to whom the language is native for these reasons as will be readily understood in making selections from those writers whose mother tongue is english specimens have been given of all periods from the earliest time and occasionally of authors who would not otherwise find a place in such a collection for the purpose of tracing and outline the development of english prose and the formation of an english style which like all true and great styles is peculiar to the language and cannot be reproduced in any other this is not the place nor would it be feasible with any reasonable limits to narrate the history of english prose but in these selections it is possible to follow its gradual advance from its first rude and crude attempts through the splendid irregularities of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries to the establishment of a standard style in the eighteenth and thence onward to the modifications and changes in that standard which extend to our own time the purpose of this collection is not didactic if it were it would be a schoolbook and not an anthology in the greek sense where the first principle was to seek what was of literary value artistic in expression and noble in thought yet the mere bringing together of examples of prose from the writings of the great masters of style cannot but teach a lesson never more needed than now i do not mean by this to suggest imitation of any writer nothing is more dangerous especially when the style of the writer imitated is peculiar and strongly marked that which is valuable and instructive is the opportunity given here for a study of fine english styles and in this way to learn the capabilities of the language and the general principles which have governed the production of the best english prose we have in the english language an unequalled richness of vocabulary far surpassing in extent that of any other it possesses a great literature and body of poetry unrivalled in modern times it is not only one of the strongest bonds of union in the united states but it is the language in which our freedom was won and in which our history and our laws are written it is our noblest heritage to weaken corrupt or deprave it would be a misfortune without parallel to our entire people yet we cannot disguise from ourselves the fact that the fertility of the printing press the multiplication of cheap magazines and the flood of printed words poured out daily in the newspapers all tend strongly in this direction direction this is an era of haste and hurry stimulated by the great inventions which have changed human environment form and style in any art require time and time seems the one thing we can neither spare nor wisely economize yet in literature above all arts to abandon form and style is inevitably destructive and entails misfortunes which can hardly be estimated for loose weak and vulgar writing is a sheer precursor of loose weak and vulgar thinking if form of expression is cast aside form in thought and in the presentation of thought is certain to follow against all this is the fine english prose amply represented in these selections offers a silent and convincing protest to every one who will read it attentively we can begin with the splendid prose of the age of elizabeth and of the seventeenth century it is irregular and untamed but exuberant and brilliant rich both in texture and substance we find it at its height in the strange beauties of sir thomas brown and the noble pages of milton stiff with golden embroidery as macaulay says and in the touching and beautiful simplicity of bunyan's childlike sentences 
thence we pass to the eighteenth century when english prose was freed from its involutions and irregularities and brought to uniformity and a standard the age of anne gave to english prose balance precision and settled form there have been periods in greater originality but the eighteenth century at least lived up to pope's doctrine set forth in the familiar line what oft was thought but ne'er so well expressed as there is no better period to turn to for instruction than the age of anne so if we must choose a single writer there is no better master to be studied than swift there have been many great writers and many fine and beautiful styles since the days of the terrible dean of st patrick's from imposing and finely balanced sentences of gibbon to the subtle delicacy of hawthorne and the careful finish of robert louis stevenson but in swift better than any one writer we find the lessons which are so sorely needed now he had in the highest degree force clearness and concentration all combined with marvellous simplicity swift's style may have lacked richness but it never failed in taste there is not a line of false fine writing in all his books those are the qualities which are needed now simplicity and clearness and a scrupulous avoidance of that would-be fine writing which is not at all fine but merely vulgar and insincere the writing in our newspapers is where reform is particularly needed there are great journals here and there which maintain throughout a careful standard of good and sober english most of them unhappily are too often filled in the news columns at least with the strange jargon found nowhere else spoken by no one and never used in daily life by those who every night furnish it to the compositors it is happily compounded in about equal parts of turgid fine wilting vulgar jauntiness and indiscriminate slang the best i can show my meaning by an example a writer in a newspaper wished to state that a man who had once caused excitement by a book of temporary interest and who after the days of his notoriety were over lived a long and checkered career had killed himself this is the way he said it his life's work void of fruition and dissipated into emptiness his fondest hopes and ambitions crumbled and scattered shunned as a fanatic and unable to longer wage life's battle hinton rowan helper at one time united states consul general to buenos aires yesterday sought the darkest egress from his woes and disappointments a suicide's death in an unpretentious lodging-house in pennsylvania avenue near the capitol the man who as much as if not more than any other agitator is said to have blazed the way to the civil war the writer who stirred this nation to its core by his anti-slavery philippics and the promoter with the most gigantic railroad enterprise projected in the history of the world was found gripped in the icy hand of death the brain which gave birth to his historic writings had willed the stilling of the heart which for three quarters of a century had palpitated quick and high with roseate hopes that passage taken at hazard from a newspaper is intended i think to be fine writing of an imposing and dramatic kind why could not the writer have written it a little more carefully perhaps but still in just the language which we would have used naturally in describing the events to his friend or wife simply stated it would have been far more solemn and impressive than this turgid insincere account with its large words its forced note of tragedy and its split infinitive let me put beneath it another description of a deathbed the blood and spirits of lefebvre were waxing cold and slow and were retreating to their last citadel the heart rallied back the film forsook his eyes for a moment he looked up wistfully into my uncle toby's face then cast a look upon his boy and that ligament fine as it was was never broken nature instantly ebbed away the film returned to its place the pulse fluttered stopped went on throbbed stopped again moved stopped shall i go on no this famous passage is neither unintentional sentiment nor unaffected pathos the art is apparent even in the punctuation the writer meant to be touching and pathetic and to awaken emotions of tenderness and pity and he succeeded the description is all he meant it to be the extract from the newspaper arouses no emotion unless it be resentment at its form and leaves us cold and unmoved the other is touching and pitiful 
observe the manner in which stern obtains his effect to the perfect simplicity and good taste of every word the reserve the gentleness the utter absence of any straining for effect the one description died the day it appeared the other has held its place for a century and a half are not the qualities which produced such a result worth striving for let me take another haphazard selection from a description of a young girl entitled as such to everyone's kindness courtesy and respect in it occurs this sentence the college girl is grammatical in speech but she has the jolliest chummiest jargon of slang that ever rolled from under a pink tongue that articulate sound comes from beneath a tongue is at least novel and few persons are fortunate enough to be able to talk without that portion of their mouths but i have no desire to dwell either upon the anatomical peculiarities of the sentence or upon its abysmal vulgarity it is supposed to be effective it is what is appropriately called breezy it is a form of words which can be heard nowhere in the speech of men and women why should it be consigned to print it is possible to describe a young girl attractively and effectively in a much simpler fashion let me give an example not a famous passage at all from another writer she shocked no canon of taste she was admirably in keeping with herself and never jarred against the surrounding circumstances her figure to be sure so small as to be almost childlike and so elastic that motion seemed as easier or easier to it than the rest would hardly have suited one's idea of a countess neither did her face with brown ringlets on either side and a slightly piquant nose and wholesome in bloom and the clear shade of tan and the half dozen freckles friendly remembrances of the april sun and breeze precisely give us the right to call her beautiful but there was both lustre and depth in her eyes she was very pretty as graceful as a bird and graceful much in the same way as pleasant about a house as a gleam of sunshine falling on the floor through a shadow of twinkling leaves or as a ray of firelight that dances on the wall while evening is drawing nigh contrast this with a newspaper sentence and the sensation is one of pain again i say observe the method by which hawthorne gets his effect the simplicity of the language the balance of the sentences the reserve the refinement and the final imaginative touch in the charming comparison with which the passage ends to blame the hard-working men who write for the day which is passing over them because they do not write like stern and hawthorne would be as absurd as it would be unjust but they ought to recognize the qualities of fine english prose they ought to remember that they can improve their readers by giving them good simple english pure and undefiled and they ought not to debauch the public taste by vulgar fine writing and even more vulgar light writing in short they ought to write for the public as they would talk to their wives and children and friends a little more formally and carefully perhaps but in the same simple and direct fashion for the prolific authors of the flood of stories which every month bears its broad bosom many tons of advertisements no such allowances need be made they are not compelled to furnish copy between daylight and dark they need a course of study in english prose more than any one else and they would profit by the effort as a class they seem like the young man in du maurier's picture who being asked if he had read thackeray replies no i never read novels i write them in this age of quickening movement and restless haste it is above all things important to struggle against the well-nigh universal inclination to abandon all efforts for form and style they are the true preservers of what is best in literature the salt which ought never to lose its savour those who use english in public speech and public writing have serious responsibility too generally forgotten and disregarded no single man can hope to effect much by any plea he can make in behalf of the use of good english whether written or spoken but no one i think can read the great masterpieces of english prose and not have both lesson and responsibility brought home to him he would be insensible indeed if he did not feel after such reading that he was a sharer in the noble heritage which it behooved him to guard and cherish if this series serves no other purpose it will exhibit to those who read it some of the splendours and the beauties of english prose it will at least open the gates of literature and perhaps lead 
its readers to authors they have not known before or recall the words of writers who have entered into their lives and thoughts and thus make them more mindful of the inestimable value to them and their children of the great language which is at once their birthright and their inheritance end of section fourteen Section 15 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. The Origin of Certain Americanisms. Part 1. Some words on language may be well applied and take them kindly though they touch your pride words lead to things the accepted manner of defining americans either male or female in the london comic papers or in second-rate english novels is to lard their speech plentifully with calculate and guess and with well at the opening of each sentence this mode of marking or any other is in itself totally unimportant but linguistically it is not without interest for while it is purely conventional as now used and has no relation to any american habits of the present day whether good or bad it is pleasant to note that the hard-working insular humorists need not have gone so far afield to find the words necessary for the identification of americans they really had but to turn to the new letters of thomas carlyle and there read the following sentence he has brought you a fox's book of martyrs which i calculate will go in the parcel to-day you will get right good reading out of it i guess this was a private letter in which carlyle was neither satirizing nor imitating anybody and used quite naturally words to which he was accustomed yet every one of those which are printed in italics is employed by british writers to characterize american speech and to show at the same time how vulgar and degenerate it is calculate as used by carlyle was three-quarters of a century ago typically american and especially characteristic of new england it is now rarely heard anywhere in the united states carlyle's use of guess in the american fashion also meaning to think or suppose has behind it the best authority one at least much older than shakespeare who was likewise american enough to guess for chaucer says in the prologue of twenty year of age he was i guess pope uses guess in the american fashion very frequently in his letters coleridge was addicted to it he uses it in christabel i guess twas frightful there to see and also in his letters i guess i shall be there in seven days and again which formed i guess part of the impulse which occasioned my last letter wordsworth has it also in he was a lovely youth i guess a line which it seems almost cruel to quote because it reflects so severely upon the memory of a great poet indeed it almost surpasses that other bit of champion prosaic verse a mr wilkinson clergyman so beloved of tennyson and fitzgerald robert louis stevenson writes otherwise much the same i guess quite naturally and without italics or quotation marks chaucer shakespeare pope gray coleridge wordsworth carlyle stevenson at least we americans sin in good company when we guess and we might aptly say to the insular humorist who is unread in these authors that it is better to err with pope than shine with pie but of course seriously speaking the word guess is a good old english word and the american usage is both excellent and correct as well as far truer to the tradition and spirit of the language than the british which substitutes of fancy imagine or expect which last is also american and quite grotesquely wrong because it can properly apply only to the future pope's name in byron's line is a reminder that the other italicized phrase of right good in carlyle's letter still demands a word of explanation in justice to carlyle it should be said in passing that he is not the only great writer of that period who used right good dickens who hated americans and all things american with a sleepless hatred difficult now to comprehend even as the result of wounded vanity speaks of a right good income in one of his letters 
right good is common in colloquial speech in certain parts of the united states and real good in all both are as i have said colloquial neither would be considered good english or be employed by any careful writer or speaker yet i am sorry to say for i dislike the use of either phrase that those who indulge in them will find if they turn to spence's anecdotes that pope the very apostle of correctness speaks of prior as not a right good man and a little later is quoted as saying that garth van Brew, and congreve were the three most honest-hearted real good men of the poetical members of the kit-kat club i have tried to convince myself that pope if correctly quoted by spence used real as an adjective but the punctuation renders this explanation a strained one at best impossible yet even the high authority of the greatest of queen anne's poets while it shows whence carlyle dickens and americans alike derive these phrases cannot make right good the best english or real good anything but a vulgarism yet it is well for the british critic to remember that when he is defending our common language from these two americanisms he is at the same time condemning pope dickens and carlyle who would be surprised i think to find that they had been guilty of two typical instances of american shortcomings in the difficult art of speaking english let me pause a moment before i go further to say that i have not forgotten mr lang's reply to mr matthews who had been printing some hideous neologisms and coinages taken from current british publications of which we in the united states were quite guiltless mr lang then wrote a word or phrase does not become a Britishism because one good writer lets it fall from his pen, nor because it appears in the prose of a writer of advertisements. And again, I hope Mr. Matthews will understand that to pick a few neologisms or vulgarisms of no general currency out of such sources as he searches in is not to prove that the peccant terms are in general national use if mr lang would only have applied these rules in criticizing the english spoken by a majority of those who now use and love that splendid speech it would have been well but this does not concern me here the examples i have thus far quoted and all that i shall quote are not called from advertisements still less are they given to convict the inhabitants of great britain of using neologisms or vulgarisms the phrases i quote have been picked up casually in that desultory reading which dr johnson so wisely defended and which was not indulged in with any linguistic purpose my object is merely to show that those british writers who talk idiotically about the american language and groan over the injury wrought in our common speech by american innovations ought to know english literature at least superficially before they cry out so that they may be enabled to shriek intelligently chaucer shakespeare pope gray coleridge stevenson and carlyle cannot be brushed aside as advertisements or as good writers who let fall a word they represent the best english of their times and the phrases they used whether good or bad may be set down as characteristic and accepted english in great britain at their respective periods the employment of phrases or words by writers like these demonstrates the usage of the time in this way we get the pedigree of many americanisms and it is well to remember that because the men who brought shakespeare's and milton's english the only english they could bring to the new world retained phrases and words which have since become obsolete in england it does not therefore follow that those words and phrases thus preserved are american inventions or dangerous and vulgar innovations as showing the truth of what i have just said let me take a familiar illustration which when followed out in detail demonstrates quite perfectly the danger of branding a word or its use as an americanism simply because it is not current in great britain today rare as applied to meat instead of the english underdone has always been held up as a rank and very absurd americanism let us see in christ's hospital twenty years ago lamb i wish that we could claim him as an american says portions of the same flesh rotten roasted or rare here is the american usage let us take another step backward in the abysm of time dryden writes 
in his translation from ovid of the story of bosses and philomen dryden writes and new-laid eggs which bosses's busy care turned by gentle fire and roasted rare now we can guess whence rare came to america it was good seventeenth-century english and the englishmen who came to america brought it with them and their descendants kept it but whence came the word with that significance into english it has a pedigree outdating those of purest norman descent turn to an anglo-saxon dictionary and you will find the word hirar rear or raw so we discovered that our americanism of rare meat is purely anglo-saxon and this fact suggests that before accusing us of a misuse of the word rare english critics should learn that it is not an offspring of the latin rarus but a sound almost unchanged saxon word of an entirely different meaning although it has not been so much insisted upon lately not many years ago from the time of dickens and the american notes onward it used to be solemnly pointed out that americans could be immediately identified by their shocking habit of using well constantly at the beginning of a sentence either reflectively or as an exclamation some years since in a brief essay i pointed out that shakespeare constantly used well in this fashion at the beginning of sentences since then i have noted some other authors of repute who were guilty of this habit thereby identifying themselves as americans with imperfect knowledge of their native tongue it occurs constantly for example in sir thomas mallory's version of the mort d'arthur and we find it at the beginning of one of marlowe's mighty lines when cosro says well since i see the state of persia droop another phrase for which we americans were wont to be censored was good time in the sense that one enjoyed oneself the clumsy circumlocution necessary to explain the words thus combined shows at once the soundness and excellence of the phrase yet in the latter nineteenth century the british undertook to restrict the use of good time to a woman's confinement just as in the same period they insisted that sick despite shakespeare and the bible and the prayer book must be limited to describing nausea and no other ill that flesh is heir to we need only go to dryden to demonstrate that the american use of good time has the best authority in absalom and achitophel occur these lines during his office treason was no crime the sons of belial had a glorious time so glorious or good time was in good seventeenth-century english approved by dryden and the english-speaking people in america used it and being isolated in those days let it take root and kept it they were wise in doing so wiser than their english brethren for it is a terse sound phrase good english and not easily replaced it must in justice be said that the british are now coming round to the usage of dryden and of the united states stevenson says in one of the valima letters i have the loveliest time henry greville uses pleasant time in the american sense in eighteen fifty four sir leslie stephen than whom there was no more careful writer uses good time in the american sense in his introduction to the letters of j r green and i have also found it employed in similar fashion by canon anger who is certainly most fastidious in all things literary so we may feel sure i think that this sound seventeenth-century americanism has been vindicated and is returning to the complete possession of that wide application of which insular usage at one time tried to deprive it in the same way mad was used with the american sense of angry in the seventeenth century we find it in pepys it is also found in defoe my lord i said you are in a passion it makes me mad he said again in robinson crusoe friday who is learning english from his master says why you angry mad in both these instances it is used explicitly in the sense of angry but with defoe as with pepys it seems to be wholly colloquial yet it remained in use never sinking apparently to the condition of vulgarism or of mere slang the seventeenth and eighteenth century usage lost in england has been retained in the united states and the employment of the word in the sense of angry has continued unchanged no good writer or speaker would use it in either book or speech 
but in the common talk of daily life mad for angry is still thought permissible and if neither elegant nor of literary propriety it is equally removed from being considered mere vulgarism the word ride presents a very similar case i was brought up to use ride only with reference to riding on horseback but american usage has extended its application to being carried in any form of conveyance whether in carriages or horse-drawn vehicles which was formerly described as driving or in street cars railroad trains motor cars or even in boats i had supposed this misapplication of ride as it appeared to me was a modern growth but i found with some surprise that pope in his letters applied it to being carried in vehicles generally here again the american use dates back to the english usage of the eighteenth century another word not infrequently employed like calculate to mark an american in english books and comic clever descriptive of the intelligence but with a shade of meaning which none of these equivalents exactly conveys the word in this form is widely diffused in the united states although it has been perhaps peculiarly characteristic of new england where smartness of that kind was greatly admired in england smart has of late been applied only to external objects to appearance to dress to equipages and the like both usages are old and good one has been largely abandoned in england both have remained in america we find smart applied to dress in the lincolnshire tale cited by hollowell in his dictionary of archaisms on the other hand the word is employed in the american sense by goldsmith in the citizen of the world who there speaks of a youth of smart parts again he speaks of smart verses we learn from dickens immortal description of the eatanswill election that fiskin's agent was a smart fellow very smart fellow indeed oilman in his unfinished life of coleridge says he coleridge was according to modern phraseology smart and clever gilman's book appeared in eighteen thirty eight and this statement is curious for it seems to indicate that the american usage familiar to goldsmith was making a reappearance in england and was regarded as a novelty if it did so appear the word evidently failed to make its way at that time another interesting thing in gilman's sentence is that he includes clever in the quotation marks with smart as if clever in the sense of quick and intelligent was a novel usage one not thoroughly established clever is now generally if not exclusively used in that sense in both great britain and the united states but in the middle of the last century and for twenty years later clever was used universally in new england and quite generally i think in the united states in the sense of good-natured honest and kindly without any suggestion of keen intelligence i well remember hearing people say sometimes when using the word in what is now universally accepted manner i mean the english clever it seems evident that the old use of smart in both senses continued in england down to the end of the eighteenth century and then the application of the word to a man's intelligence disappeared while in america both applications survived as to clever in the old american sense of good-natured not only goldsmith but gray in his letters is a witness that this use of the word was in good and recognized standing in the england of the eighteenth century the usage lingered in the popular speech of america long after it had disappeared in england and now although still occasionally heard in the united states has been practically abandoned in both countries different from can hardly be called an americanism because it can be found in english writers of the highest mark at all periods byron for example used different from in his letters and so too does matthew arnold in his but during the last century a fashion grew up in england of saying and writing different too i have met with it in many recent authors of repute and some americans the few who like to ape english habits good or bad undertook to use it in this country with very slight success there never was either warrant or reason for different too and it is clearly ungrammatical as was strongly shown by a writer in the spectator not long ago in an article condemning this practice among some of his countrymen different from is not only correct but if any one desires authority he can find a great one in dr johnson who uses it in his letters charles fox also used different from in speaking 
the universal american usage i am glad to think is again prevailing in england where it was set aside only in obedience to some strange freak for which no cause can be alleged the best statement of the case can be found in a letter from lewis carroll the author of the alice books to miss edith ricks in eighteen eighty six he says now i come to your letter dated december twenty second and i must scold you for saying that my solution of the problem was quite different to all common ways of doing it if you think that's good english well and good but i must beg to differ to you and to hope you will never write me a sentence similar from this again in the latter part of the last century also it was the fashion in england to condemn mutual friend and insist upon common friend the latter never effected a lodgment in america except among those who wished to be different to their fellow countrymen without discussing the merits of the two forms it may be noted that there is excellent and abundant authority for the american usage not only did dickens use mutual friend as a title of one of his novels but i have found it more than a century earlier in one of stern's letters to lydia and have also come across it in both oilman's and cottle's memoirs of coleridge and in lavengro as well as in mr dice's preface to his edition of marlowe byron in his conversations with lady blessington and thackeray in party giving snobs and twice in the roundabout paper on a joke i heard from the late thomas hood are both guilty of the americanism mutual friend thomas campbell in his life of mrs siddons speaks of meeting our mutual friend End of section fifteen